Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Uh, this week, we're going to St. Petersburg in Russia, home to a really large community being keyed up by Key Real here. Correct. Hi there. We'll try our best not to butcher your name over the course of this podcast. We originally found you because you're running a team tournament coming up in your local city, and it sounded like you've got a pretty large community. And you've done some TTS, and I think you're the head of the European TTS-like organization on um, Command Point, right? Well, I wouldn't call that an organization. That's like, I'm just the TO for the CPTS yeah, okay. Europe yeah. out there. But you're like the head TO for the European side? Well, I manage some stuff, but uh, there's two of us who do that. So I cannot like take all the road, all the road is for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just, it's cool because I think, well, it's nice for us to get a little bit in touch with the tabletop simulator community, along with catching up with a little bit about the Russian scene, because it sounds like you've done stuff in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. And it sounds like you've got experience playing Gellerpox and some of the other Melee Horde teams. So I'm excited to hear about all of the niche tactics and operatives. True, true, true. Some hot takes about Vetguard, which is uh, surprisingly we haven't chatted a whole lot about, but I'm, I'm also excited to dig into that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But before we get into the fun stuff, you know, what's been going on in your regular lives? Oh, life has been like both challenging and fun these days. The mm-hmm. big tournament you mentioned, uh, it's actually not the upcoming one. It's the one we've had this Sunday. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is a very fun, very big tournament. But uh, outside of Q-Team, uh, everything's great, I would say. Yeah, I was just, uh, I think I just got turned down from the GW position, unfortunately. So I'm just back to watching TV and uh, trying to get another, a normal job, a day job. Interesting. And uh, what position did you apply? I applied for the Kill Team dev position, and I made it through the interviews, but I, that's where I got cut. So, Well, that's something already, I would say. Yeah, it was fun. I wrote a humongous document, so maybe I'll put that out for our Patreon subscribers. Hey, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, outside of, uh, you know, job search, you know, I started watching Gen V, the uh, Boys Universe TV show. Pretty good. Oh, I watched a couple of series, a couple of episodes. Uh, I'm not a big fan at the moment. I think it picks up, or I really enjoyed the fourth episode's writing, I guess. But, you know, it is uh, it is very dark. Oh, I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. Like so I, I compare you... it to, like, uh, have you watched the Invincible? Yes, Invincible was, all, was excellent. Well, I, I compare it to that, because it's, like, very mm. similar, and Invincible is much better. Yes, I think Invincible is, is much, much better. I also think that because it's animated, they can do a lot more stuff than they can in The Boys, where it's like, it's got to stay somewhat grounded, because there's just only so many special effects they can do for a TV show. True, true, of course. Yeah. Invincible is great, though. I love it. If anyone has not watched that, it's definitely a must-watch, I think, if you like superheroes. Yeah. I actually just wrote both of those down. Uh, I've got my running list of TV to watch once my busy season slows down. Once you get to your hibernation phase? Yes. Soon enough, eventually. I can even recommend uh, reading the comics, the original ones of Invincible. Like, I'm not a big comics fan at all. Uh, I, like, hate them because it's, like, very little information per page. And I had hate sliding the pages one by one because I read, read pretty fast. But Invincible is quite interesting to even to read. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard good things about it. And there's a, it's a pretty large um, comic, so there's a lot of content. Yeah, at least for several seasons more. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Um, my Lately, I've kind of been uh, a little bit on the back burner with Kill Team. Uh, work has been pretty busy for me. Um, pretty much my whole life is either DJing or planning and coordinating for the next time I'm going to DJ, doing equipment handoffs with my other DJ friends. And uh, just if, if I'm not doing any of that, then trying to catch up on sleep from just like you get a couple days in a row of just hustling the whole day and sleeping five hours and running off to the next one and crash a bunch through the week to catch up on sleep it's been fun but it has been tiring yeah hopefully hopefully it's not like that over in russia when you run tournaments uh uh how would you say for example uh before this team tournament uh so on saturday i slept like uh four four hours so then i went to the to the tournament uh returned by train and i can't sleep on the trains uh so and uh, i decided not to go to sleep on monday and uh, go through this day so it was like about uh almost 
48 hours without, without sleep. <laughs> so Sounds this like happens. A zombie territory to me. Full blown. Yeah. How often do you run tournaments? Uh, oh, this is a good topic for like going to the Russian scene because uh, there are two sides uh, of Russian tournaments, I would say. The Moscow side and the St. Petersburg. Uh, the Moscow, like you may know, is the second largest uh, city in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, its skill scene is uh, pretty like big. But for some reason, the quantity of TOs is uh, like almost almost nothing. It has like only several people who who want to organize tournaments. Okay. So they they have uh, uh, only like uh, a few tournaments uh, a in a couple of months, maybe one or two, mm -hmm. and uh, opposite to that in Saint Petersburg, uh, even though we are like three or four times uh, smaller, the city itself and um, the scene is maybe like twice or three times smaller. We have tournaments almost uh, almost every two weeks, basically. Wow. Maybe like even more. And so, there's like lots of shops who organize that, lots of uh, independent TOs who do that. And do you find that a lot of Moscow or Mos Moscovites are coming over to St. Petersburg to play? Uh, there are some people who do that. There is a, a, one of our best players who basically mm -hmm. lives in both cities. Okay. Uh, so he goes to pretty much almost every tournament okay. uh, and uh, dominates mo uh, lots of them. Is so, he a backyard player? No, he is an intercessions player. Oh, cool. All right. Probably one of the best in the world, I would say. Yeah, I would, I would say that there's probably not a ton of intercession players still ranking very high on a lot of uh, tournaments at this point. Oh, oh, you are too fast. He's now playing commandos. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he, he, joined, he joined the meta, the green tide, as it were, for the summer. Yeah, well, to be fair, he bought commandos like last year mm -hmm. and uh, won one tournament with them, if I remember correctly. Uh, but then uh, right after that, intercession came out. And he jumped to them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, recently he returned to Commandos back. Okay. So you've got two scenes kind of orbiting each other. One in Moscow, another in St. Petersburg. And you have more TOs in St. Petersburg, but there's not a ton of cross travel. So this last tournament that you just ran uh, this weekend was a team tournament, right? Yes. And the team tournament, it was held in Moscow? Yep. Yes. Okay. So... Was that like a joining of the two scenes so that everyone could play together in one big pool? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. We've got uh, people from over, over Russia and uh, even other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got people from Armenia. We've got people from, uh, good question, where is this guy uh, named Alec Johnson? <laughs> I think okay. he's uh, either German or British. Uh, I should ask for them. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was mixed, mixed event, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, St. Petersburg dominated the scene as always. <laughs> All right. So how many people showed up at this, uh, really large team tournament that just happened just so that, you know, listeners can get a feel for how big the, you know, greater Russian kill team scene is. So as far as I know, this was, uh, arguably, I am not sure, but, uh, probably the biggest, uh, kill team team tournament up to date. In the mm -hmm. whole world, we had 22 teams of three, so 66 okay. players. Nice. That sounds really fun. How many rounds did you guys end up doing? Six rounds? Oh, four. Four. Oh, okay. All right. That was quite enough to uh, get the winner. So with teams of three, what was the, the layout? Like, how did that all work? It was like team captains show up and like there's boards that you, you set people out on or... Um, what was the flow of the team event? So uh, we use the uh, infamous Swords and Shield system, where captains uh, basically pair uh, their teams uh, with each other, uh, even though we uh, kind of change it. Basically, almost every team tournament, trying to find the ideal, the ultimate variant. Uh, 
the rules we have uh, found uh, quite uh, good is to first uh, have uh, one into the duct table per line, uh, one uh, table which is quite open, uh, I mean open and uh, also uh, less heavy on terrain, and mm -hmm. one open table which is kind of more heavy on terrain. So we have three types of tables to, to choose from. And, that's actually a good. I think that's a really nice evolution of just open and in the dark. Like having a sparse open and a heavy open actually sounds like a nice way to make it so all three decision points um, actually matter. Yep. And also the important thing is to have uh, to not have a mission which is chosen uh, by players and not by uh, round. What do so, you mean by uh, that? So the hours in our sword and shoot, for example. Uh, let's say uh, I, I was the first shield, so uh, I choose my uh, table first. For example, mm -hmm. I choose into the dark. Uh, my opponent, after this, chooses the mission. So he, out okay. of the basic ones, loot, secure, and chap uh, capture. Uh, and this uh, makes uh, a lot of uh, tactical decisions for captains, uh, because... Uh, it's you, you don't always want to choose table first. Sometimes you want to choose a mission first. So like is each mission can only be chosen once? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're allowing the scores to be pretty pretty disparate across the three boards then. Were, um, were you guys doing a sum total or uh two out of one? Or like best of three basically across the, the three pairings? Uh, oh, we were using just uh, points for either win or loss. So okay. you can get uh, up to six points. So two for win uh, and one for tie. Uh, and zero for all loss, obviously. And you can get up to, each team can get up to six. Mm -hmm. I mean, one team can get up to six, another zero in this situation. I see. So you weren't going by overall points scored per board. You're going by actual wins or losses across the, the three pairings, which I think is, I haven't done that. When I've done team tournaments, we did points total so that if someone tanked a little bit, the other person could still carry them out a little bit. And it would uh, basically give you a little bit of reason to kind of like push points a little bit. But I think wins and losses is a perfectly fine way to do it as well. So, well, And I think uh, being able to choose missions is a nice twist. Yeah, the, the thing is, uh, VPs are also important. Because they are a secondary for pairings and placements. Okay. So you should still uh, try to earn that VP. Yeah, it's still one of your tiebreakers for pairing. Yes, indeed. Okay. But I think with 22 players and four rounds, you actually get like an undefeated at the top, unless a bunch of teams are tying somehow in this much stricter picking format, which should be harder. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because I think one, one undefeated team. Yeah, I think having more levers at the beginning of the game means that actually getting ties should be way harder, right? Because the players are selecting both missions and pairings. So the skew matchups should be much, much harder than they would be otherwise, I think. Yeah, yeah, true. Cool. So who who was who won? What was the final trip triple triplicate? Oh, uh the uh first team is uh the a mixed team from St. Petersburg and uh, Armenia. Mm -hmm. uh, a team of uh, top, uh, I think top five or top four at the moment of ITC rating, Nikita Fior, okay. playing Vedgard. Yep. Uh, I've heard his name. Yeah. Uh, his teammate, uh, Alexander Regor, playing Or Commandos. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another CPTS champion, uh, Journey from Armenia, playing. Uh, Navy Breachers. That seems like a, a hard team, a hard triple to beat right now in team tournaments. Yeah, that I, I would say they are pretty much one of the best teams, uh, like maybe top top five teams at the moment. These three. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Speaking of that guard, we're going. Should we do some operative showdown, Jason? I was going to say, uh, do we want to dive into the TTS stuff a little bit more before we do that? So uh, TTS uh, is, uh, I would say, big in uh, both Russia and outside. I would say America is probably like uh, the first one by number of players. Uh, we are the second. And uh, Spain is like both can 
earn, earn a lot, lot of players, but they don't want to organize anything for some reason, uh, or or doing or doing that without uh, any like uh, any news about the tournaments. Spain's Spain's CTS stuff they like keep internal, from what I remember. Like yeah, it sounds like Spain Spanish players play against Spanish players on TTS, but then they don't. Then not a ton of them play outside of outside of their region. It sounds like yeah. I think they had the tournament, uh, big tournament last year on DTS, which has like 60 players. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, outside of that, I haven't heard about their tournaments on DTS since. Uh, by comparison, for example, uh, we have uh, our little tournament had uh, in Russia 36 players, I think. Uh, and this was like a, a bit of a boom for Russian TTS community for some reason. Uh, more players are joining each day, uh, enjoying the TTS. I think the the current TTS table system is much much better than it was even like a year ago. It's much much easier to like just pick up and play. So I'm sure that does help because it, it was originally a big barrier for me. So for anyone who doesn't know, the new TTS mod is pretty all inclusive, if I remember correctly. It's like all the teams and all the boards all built into like one table, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, this is much easier to start today than it was yeah. like two years ago. I think when I was last trying to do it, even a couple months ago, I hadn't, I didn't know about this board. So this, you had to go to a third-party website to generate a code to pick up the characters, and now everything is just in boxes, pre-built, right? I mean, you can still do, still do that, still pre pre-make a team if you want to. But uh, if you just want to go straight into the game, yeah, it's much easier. You only yeah. need a, a mod for the table, and uh, if you're playing open, a mod for the open board, mm -hmm. which are a lot of them. Yeah. Do you find that there's a lot of differences between TTS players and then real life games? This is a very hot question, a very hot topic to discuss, <laughs> because uh, some players uh, consider TTS like not a cute team at all, mm -hmm. uh, and others are defending it. I am on the second side. I think it's pretty much the same. The biggest difference is... Uh, there are two, two biggest differences. The first one is time. Because in real life, you are either uh, playing an open game and uh, you are just relaxing, but you don't want to overthink it. Or mm. you are in the tournament setting and you have a timer. In TTS, people are usually playing after work, they are relaxing, they can finish like in the night because they're home, they can go to, to bed right afterwards. So the games can take up to like three hours or four without mm -hmm. any trouble. Uh, this is the first difference. And the second one is obviously measuring. Because in TTS you can be really exact with measuring. Mm -hmm. much, mu much more exact than in real life. However, this problem uh, currently is uh, being overridden by the tools which are presented nowadays uh, for Qtim. Uh, like, you know, the laser ruler, which uh, uh, gives the line on the table, or the Qtim, uh, well, not Qtim, but uh, any board game steppers, which, like, step, uh, you, know, you know, you put it near the base and they, like, make one inch, then another inch, and yeah. you basically, like, chain, chain lock them. Right, to, right, like that. Yeah, I think we gave out one inch uh, discs to players so that they could do one inch movements around corners because it's an easy way to like visualize that kind of movement. And then obviously the laser line has been probably necessary since the very beginning to handle obscurity and cover lines and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So all this stuff is like not really uh, that that different nowadays, mm -hmm. but people are still still mad about it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I think for what it's worth, like TTS is probably a good practice tool, but playing in real life is probably also its own skills, like being able to manage your physical space, being able to manage the pressure of playing in person with your actual things is always different than just playing on a computer. I've seen it on Magic Arena when people play in real life, they're like, oh my god, I have to like shuffle my own deck and figure out where everything is. And then also in Kill Team, watching TTS players have to like physically handle things, it's it's the different, there is like a physicality that is not captured on TTS. True, true, true. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, the measuring also, yeah. There is uh, the one I think I forgot to mention, measuring uh, the, the option to uh, move a model and then load it back. Oh, this yes. is pretty much probably the biggest factor. 
yeah you can actually save life. you can actually save your state and then go back yeah, yeah. So. one of the other cool things about tts you can actually like save a game and then just pick it up the next day with a friend if you wanted to right yeah but i think throughout this couple of years i think because there was only one game i did like this uh because i think or maybe two i think because mm -hmm. uh and a uh, player's internet connection was, was bad mm -hmm. so i think most people either finish their games or just uh don't continue them at all have you found that you're organizing Russia, like Russian players in St. Petersburg and Moscow on your own Discord? Or is there a public Discord that everyone is using? I know Command Point does a lot of TTS stuff, but is there like a Russian speaking Discord that you all hang out in? Uh, Command Point indeed uh, have the international community, but for Russia, we don't use Discord, we use Telegram. Uh, this is a me messenger sim similar to WhatsApp, Mm -hmm. uh, and we use it because it's kind of easier, at least for our opinion. Yeah. So it sounds like you guys are organizing off of Telegram, which is which is cool. I think uh, a lot of us on the US side feel like use Discord at this point. Um, have you found it easy to grow the Kill Team scene? I know you've been playing since the beginning of the edition. Like, what's the journey been like? Oh, the journey was uh, very, very interesting, but I wouldn't call it hard because uh at the start of the edition uh there was a big lack of lack of players because uh in the previous one uh there were people who like Q team and there were also uh big hammer players who just uh, decided to play this small funny format mm -hmm. and after new Q team came out most of them basically left and uh scene became very small but uh, after that, uh, new people uh, came to Kill Team. We taught them. We showed them how interesting this game is. And uh, funny enough, I think uh, Kill Team grew out of being this uh, like newbie game just to transition to Big Hammer into its own into, into its own own state. I would say. Because currently, uh, I think in Russia, we outgrew the uh, Underworld uh, scene. And I think your team has the third biggest tournaments after Big Hammer and after Age of Sigmar. And I think we'll uh, overcome Age of Sigmar quite soon. <laughs> yeah, it's an easy, easy game to get into. And like the rules are much more interactive, which is nice, especially having played 40k a little bit this summer. Yeah. Uh, even even for me, like uh, I was not not enjoying really much the eighth and ninth edition. And uh, after Q Team Twenty One came out, this was basically a nail in the coffin uh, uh, for me for Big Hammer. I and the tenth tenth edition is like final nail nail in the coffin. I don't play Big Hammer at all these days. I see. Definitely super into Kill Team. And it sounds like you've been writing some narrative stuff. Have you found narrative has a big home for your, like the, the groups that you've been playing around with in Russia? Uh, not really, to be fair. Uh, I would say, unfortunately, the Kill Team narrative stuff is very bland. Mm. The stuff that GW gave us, the spec ops, the uh, sp special rules for uh, bespoke teams, they are such a bare minimum that you need to invent many things yourself. Uh, the Into the Dark part, where you got this map, where you got the additional missions, is uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit better, I would say. But it's still not a finished product, I would say, for narrative stuff. You can play like fun games with... Uh, Especially this new uh, recent one, where you have this uh, interesting team of uh, mutants and the rock, rock psyker. Maybe you mm -hmm. saw that? Yes, the prisoner uh, mission. I used it for yeah, a yeah, new player yeah. tournament. It was like the first, I think the first round was one experienced player versus two new players. Because the prisoner can kind of like, basically you can force the newer players to interact with every rule. 
in a opposed scenario and then eventually like actually play a game. So that was how we did our new player event. And I thought I thought the rules were written in a pretty fun way. Yeah, interesting. Interesting idea. Uh, yeah, <laughs> interesting enough. I think we uh, when we teach our new players, uh, our uh, one of our uh, Saint Petersburg uh, basically teachers, <laughs> I would say, uh, he like break some rules when teaching a new players. For example, uh, he takes uh, six intercessors, uh, the assault ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, against them, he puts uh, nine Necron Warriors and an Immortal Leader. Uh, this uh, helps to show new players that there is like elite teams who are much better at everything, pretty much. They mm -hmm. have better movement, they have better shooting, they have better melee. But at the same time, uh, the uh, overactivations and the just the quantity of bodies can just uh, overcome the situation and get all board control and there's difference still yeah i think there's lots of different ways that you can teach new players one of the ones that i always stress is don't overload new players like you can't explain every rule all up front so just kind of letting people get a hold of you know moving and shooting and handling that so i think you know six six intercessors assault intercessors so the rules are all the same makes you know learning what your opponent can do much easier and then giving yourself the ability to resurrect and having lots of guns also lets you just play the fun part of the game for new players which is doing aggressive actions because i always warn people it's like i want you to have some people on conceal and some people on engage but if you have too many on engage or too many on conceal like it doesn't like the demos don't work that well so having the two different spreads of team sounds like a, a nice way to go about that yep obviously we left out the things like equipment and tech ops because mm -hmm. if if you add that, people just not want to play oh, yeah. the game. I don't even I don't even use obscurity when I teach new players. What I tell them is like, there's a rule that should happen here, but we're we're going to ignore it right now. So the next time you play, if you want me to explain the rest of it, I'll add on more of the rules. But the first time, I'm just like conceal, engage, move, shoot, dash, and that's like that's all we're really trying to handle. Because I've always found that when we get to interacting with fighting for the first time, I tell someone they can parry, and everyone just everyone's brain just breaks. For like a solid oh. like three minutes you know uh this is like the obscurity ruling is like uh you can just ignore it because there is uh, uh intercessors uh, assault, mm. uh, who don't have uh range guns and then you just don't place the uh heavy terrain there oh yeah, yeah. So i just tell them that there is another it's like i tell them that there are three layers of like for line of sight for shooting rules but we're skipping the middle layer so just they know it's there but they don't know what it is because it's not it just makes the game less fun <laughs> At least for a new yeah. player. True, true. Obscurity mm -hmm. is is not for humans. Like you know, it, it adds an important layer for skill expression, but it is not easy to teach. True. Which sucks. Um what do you feel like makes the Russian scene unique compared to some of the other scenes that you've interacted with? Because I know you're handling some of the European uh, TTS TOing for Command Point. So you've interacted with a lot of the different metas. Like, what do you think makes the Russian meta different from some of the others? <clears throat> uh, interesting question. Well, uh, first of all, I would say the meta... Well, obviously, Vedgar. <laughs> Well, we'll go to that this question later. But yeah. Vedgard is extremely dom dom is dominative in our uh, scene. Uh, but uh, also, I would say the the big difference in terrain la layouts uh, is uh, is very uh, terrain, terrain layouts is different in different uh, countries. I would say. Uh, for example, uh, we can, can compare Spain, US, and Russia. Uh, in Spain, there is lots of uh, very parallel terrain for some reason. I found it uh, well. I find find it like surprising. Uh, Spanish people say that th they are okay with that, uh, but this is just a effect. Uh, in US, there were very strange amount of. Well, it's not strange, that very uh, big amount of terrain from previous edition, which is all these crates you have. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you are changing that uh, with each terrain, but I still see, see them in some pictures sometimes. I think um, we... Are you talking about the old uh, MDF terrain, or are you talking about just like the old, like the Munitorium 
Her, no, uh, the MD, MDF, MDF. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the MDF ones are... Some regions use it a little bit more than others because I think some of the TOs actually sell the MDF terrain, so it's part of part of the business of actually being able to run those those systems. Um, and there are some downsides with MDF terrain, for sure. On the East Coast, we don't generally use MDF terrain. Everything is GW terrain of some sort, for the most part. Oh, uh, I personally re really like the uh, Warcry terrain, the Warcry ruins in Kill Team. Mm -hmm. uh, the first edition of Warcry had this uh, ruins in different, like L and maybe like Z shape. Yeah. Uh, they are very similar to Actarius, but at the same time, uh, they are also very see through. Uh, so this is like uh, adds a little bit uh, different element to the game, and uh, very fun to play in them. So terrain, you feel like is a big difference between all the different regions, right? Yeah, true. Uh, do you also... feel like there's playstyle differences in the players because of the terrain, or do you feel like um, most most players play it kind of similar, given that they interact with the same terrain? I think overall we still play uh, like each region, even Spain, US, still will use Actarius and Chalnath most and Into the Dark. So it still goes to the same uh, type of play overall. Like, I th as, as I think like, uh, there are, well, at least there were some differences with like maybe Phobos at some time, maybe the Legionary, uh, their marks. But overall, I don't think there's such a big difference. If we talk about the uniqueness, I would say I have to mention we have a very interesting gaming club, which is uh, situated in a state, uh, well, government university. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I would say this is one of the interesting things we have here. Okay, like clubs at uh, public institutions? Uh, yeah, uh, like uh, university, basically a okay. big university, one of the biggest in the city. Nice. Okay, yeah. Um, hmm. So you feel like the your scene has a large representation of Vetguard. Uh, are there other factions that you find that your region plays particularly well, online or otherwise? Mm. <laughs> other factions? I don't really think so. I think Vetguard is like the biggest difference out here. Uh, because uh, obviously at some point we had... Uh, Intercession domination last year, uh, like basically all the other countries, we had uh, the uh, the breachers uh, uh, and Gellerpox uh, playing their part, uh, and uh, ob obviously void dancers, who people hate a lot. So I can't say that there is different. Oh, the only I, I would say yeah, there is one. There mm -hmm. is one problem we always had. There is, uh, there was never one good Pathfinder player in Russia, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. There, there were, are... like, who played, like, kind of well, but there were, uh, my teammate ha had Pathfinders, but he mm -hmm. was very unlucky with dice, uh, so he dropped them, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So this is one of the differences I, I can mention. Yeah, for what it's worth, none of the regions really like Pathfinders. It's like, <laughs> I think Pathfinders might have been good, but only a handful of players ever actually wanted to play them. I mean, it sounds like we're you know we've been skirting around the topic of Vet Guard. Let's let's uh, dive in a little bit on this week's operative showdown. Operative showdown. Operative showdown. Um, this week we are chatting about the the veteran guardsmen for the operative showdown um but you know it's not really individual operatives it definitely is more about synergies um so a couple of the obvious ones are like how to synergize the spotter with other models um and maybe let's start there oh uh well first uh if you don't mind i would like to mention that in my opinion vedgard is the most broken team in the game at the moment <laughs> commandos are nothing compared to this team and Spotter is indeed one of the problems here. Uh, obviously, there is a uh, two most popular uh, combos with Spotter, which is Spotter plus Sniper, which is very safe, very uh, very sturdy, uh, very easy to use. Uh, and there is obviously Spotter plus Plasma Gun, which is great against Slits, 
Uh, obviously, very good if you're lucky with uh, four plus, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, overall a good good decision. Uh, but I would like to also mention a different choice which people seem to skip for some reason. This is a spotter with a grenade launcher, which is very good, uh, very good against core teams. Mm-hmm. Especially, uh, I, w- I can mention two. Uh, which are very afraid of it. The first one is Bloodit, and the second one is Gellerbox. Because uh, if I see uh, Redguard and if I see a Spotter, I am completely sure that uh, I am completely. I will be destroyed <laughs> by the Grenade Lamp on first get turning point. But not every guard player actually does this, because shooting at Hawks is also important with Plasma Gun. Yeah, it's a very flexible team that has basically all the options as long as you have enough operatives to actually mix your op- mix your your combos together, right? Yeah, and they have enough enough of them pretty much always. Yeah. What what other combos do you think are quite good? Cuz I think Veteran Guard are one of the most obvious teams of instead of it being about individual operatives, it's about operative pairs or operative triplicates. So do you have any other ones that you feel like Russia has been abusing if they're at the top of the meta in Russia? Uh, you know, there are basic things like uh, moving your conf- confidant with your Melta to get that reroll of uh, the, uh, what's the name of the ploy? The uh, combined arms ploy. Mm-hmm. This Basically, the... you have your, uh, your confidant shoot at someone, then you spend one for coordinated, coordinated shooting. I don't know. Oh, I don't remember what the... No, no, no. That's even, even better. If you first shoot uh, with your confidant, mm-hmm. then you shoot your Melta. And if you whiff, only after that you can you use this ploy. Yes, so this, you can this do, ploy uh, is... you can do relentless. Combined arms, right? It's yeah, a yeah. one CP that lets you get relentless after you've seen your initial dice results. Yes. If you've shot okay. at someone who's already been shot at, you can get full rerolls, which can make the confront plus anyone else a paired activation with relentless on the back half, which is very powerful. Yeah. Really Another... good against leap, right? Yeah. Very really good. Another thing I want to mention is obviously uh, the second biggest problem. Well, not not second. Actually, the f- first biggest problem of that guard is the demolition specialist, demolition uh, guardsman, because uh, his uh, his mine is basically destroys everything its way. As you know, it uh, skips uh, skip walls. It goes through walls. Uh, yep. Its uh, radius is uh, two inches, so diameter of four. And uh, one of the biggest things about it is uh, it's very easy to use. You just uh, you have and you have a very uh, a lot a lot of resources to to use it because first of all you use into the bridge to move your uh, demolition up to three, so basically a, a free combos dash you can say, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, your opponent obviously tries to play it safe, try to measure, try to stay within uh, like uh, nine and one inch from you to make it to play it safe. But then uh, this the the surgeon just says, "Oh, I can issue another order for one one CP, and uh, my demo guy moves another inch, and he will blow you up anyway." So this is very hard to just. Uh, just avoid him. It's very, very, pretty much impossible. Yeah, you you kind of have to actively deal with the demo demolition veteran, and the demolition veteran for uh, listeners. I don't know how many people are still playing against vet guard or have never seen it. It's a uh, four attacks on twos, five six AP one, uh, silent with effectively blast three from a point. So you can hit a massive area, and because you get a free dash at the end, de- generally the demolition veteran is not in range of the mine when he blows up because he plants one inch away from him so you get a six or seven inch move with one inch distance so then the overall blast range is either nine or ten inches away from wherever the demo man is placed yeah and generally it's holding plus one apl so that it can yeah do always. all three actions at the same time so it is a nine or ten inch bubble from wherever the demolition veteran is setting and that is probably one of the most obnoxious combos that veteran guard have access to and the worst thing is if you don't kill the demo veteran, he can do it again. 
Yeah, that's probably the. I think that's probably the thing that I dislike the most about the demolition veteran is that you 14 models, so you can almost always do it last or whenever you want to do it, and then if he survives, he just does it again. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, even better because even if you kill him in uh, in range range shooting, he will just atonement through honor, and he will still do it. Yep. You can only stop that but by killing him in melee. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very powerful operative and has remained a powerful operative the whole time, only getting one nerf of he can no longer place things through walls. Yeah, but with, okay. range, with such range, it's not, not a big problem. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, those are three very important combos. Do you Are, are there any other big ones that you want to call out? Uh, maybe like the Rosary ends up on the Sergeant quite a bit. Do oh, I think there is like a couple of things I can mention as well. First mm -hmm. of all, is the basic thing of using in death, in death atonement uh, against elites. So mm -hmm. uh, a, a veteran, uh, veteran, veteran guards players <laughs> uh, can uh, all, uh, in, in many times just use their basic guardsmen to charge the elite, like legionary or intercession. And uh, when they fight this uh, this uh, veteran, they just say in death atonement, and the only thing that uh, this elite guy can do is just fall back. Yeah. After death, because you cannot do anything. This is one of the best things of of best use of this ploy. Yeah, uh, I think and, veteran, uh, they can do yeah. it against the corn legionaries when they try to perpetual aggression, because you can just stand there and hold on to the legs. While you're atoning, and then against the locust, you can also do something similar from Wormblade, basically locking models up in melee. I think um, also the other one would be Void Dancers. Basically, any melee specialist model playing against Vet Guard always has to watch out for a single trooper grabbing onto your leg and not dying. You know, I can add to that. It's not a, not actually a melee model who like chain charges. I think it's actually every three AP or model, because mm -hmm. uh, when you charge with your, for example, Void Dancer. You kill this uh, veteran, uh, and he uses it in death atonement, and you cannot shoot another guy. That's yeah. also a big, a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you can waste a three pill model's uh, charge, fight, shoot, uh, fancy play, which is an important part of guardsmen being so overwhelming. Yes, and uh, talking about equipment, yes, uh, I would agree with you. The uh, the rosary goes on the, on the leader usually, mm -hmm. so to keep him safe, and he is uh, pretty much very safe because he has he has a good good weapons, both a power weapon and plasma pistol. Uh, Sucked blooded, <laughs> you don't get this thing, mm -hmm. and uh, and also you usually take obviously a crack grenade. You always take it, and you also take a chronometer, which is another. Another important equipment, which is very game-breaking, I would say. Because second turn against Vedgard is, uh, as we previously mentioned, extremely important due to the demo specialist, demo veteran, yeah. uh, demolition. Uh, and uh, if uh, veteran guardsman rolls one initiative, they can just re-roll it. Yeah, this is very powerful. Okay, yeah, we've gone over quite a few of the niche or the operatives. Um, we've gone over the sergeant veteran taking a rosary, being super tanky with threes to hit and wound, spotter combos with medic and grenadiers, which I think are always sometimes backed up by the medic so that you can cover cover the person that gets spotted, right? Yep. Confidant rolling up for combined arms with a melta or any other big gun, right? Because the confidant can do it with either the plasma or the melta, both of them. Very powerful. Yeah, and even other things like flamer or even basic guys. Doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Yeah. So those are all things that uh, you found in Russia are pushing Vetguard to be one of the most powerful teams in your region, right? I would say these are the things uh, that Vetguard uh, allows Vetguard to be on top. And uh, it doesn't really matter if it's Russia or any other thing. I think currently... Uh, in America, there is uh, a new... Oh, I, I cannot say new, but I've seen Kellen Foster. Maybe you know the guy? Yes, uh, I do know. I think the VetGuard players in the US are... A lot of them got bored of playing VetGuard. 
but we have one, we do have some diehard vet guard players in the U.S. for sure. Well, Ken Foster, Foster uses them uh, with uh, with some success, I would say. I think he was top five, uh, top, top 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 ten at some big tournament mm-hmm. recently. Uh, yeah. So keep doing that, players, American players. You will find great success. Yeah, we have a we have one guy from my local scene who went up to Canada. And he only plays that guard, basically. And he's going to the World Championships because he took the ticket from Ottawa. Yeah, this is great. Hope he... Uh, you know, I actually hope he dominates the <laughs> Invitational. Yeah. And then uh, GW maybe thinks about uh, fixing that guard. Maybe in this situation they do that. Yeah, I've always felt like the vet guard are a little bit too strong. Um, I have think that's kind of weird that they've skirted by all of the changes and all of the later balance changes to all the other teams. Like the fact that Demo Veteran can do multiple mines is still seems kind of crazy to me after every other team has a single mine usage. But like Veteran Guard had all of the tools and then they, they like they learned that it was too good and toned it down for the other teams that came up with similar abilities, but they never like retroactively put those changes back onto Vet Guard. So they're just like the OG team running around with like the top tier version of every tool and they have every tool. Yeah. yeah. They're only they're only minuses, they're kind of balanced by them hitting on fours. But it's kind of not it doesn't feel very good when you're hitting on fours re-rolling ones, because there's a you know four results that are good and two results that are bad so it still almost feels like playing with three ups so yeah i, I, I think using that. the mathematics i think the uh, four plus with the rolling ones is basically almost the same as three plus yes. almost the same yeah no it, it, they definitely feel like overtuned at the end of the day though if gw doesn't change them it is the lay of the land so we'll just i for what it's worth the vet guard do seem like they end up being harder to play than all of the maybe the the players who think they're overpowered seem to think they are is what it what it looks like because their oh, actual sure. win rates are, are just like so so across the board because they are they're not easy to play in tournament settings because you have 14 operatives which means that you do need to play very quick so you know the reason why we talked about these n- operative combos is because if you play veteran guard as a set of bunch of combo things you can use them in those small combos and move more efficiently than trying to think of like what is every single model is trying to do by itself because that's not really how the team plays yeah true well, Edgar is, is probably one of the uh, most difficult teams to play i don't know yeah. maybe compared to pathfinders pathfinders uh, are pretty hard too they're hard in different ways because veteran guard can pivot into being kind of like middling melee operatives against some teams because you can take trench shovels clear the line you can have your confidant with the chain sword so you can kind of mix it up with the eight wound models in melee but pathfinders you really can't you're really just like gunning everyone down and playing recon yep. which is a little hard yep true i think it seems like a good time to jump into the niche tactics um changing gears away from veteran guard and this time chatting about niche tactics. Yeah, getting away from the, the shooty hordes so we can talk about the melee hordes exactly <laughs> geller box are a very fun team to play but also not easy i would in my opinion even though uh like in the when you look at the team you just go forward and you kill things but uh, when you play it actually it's completely not the same the harder thing uh, hardest thing about playing killer box i would say it's the deployment because placing 15 models uh when, when four of them are on 40 millim- millimeter bases this is a basically a chore. This is m- my most hated thing with Gallery Box. Just placing models, it's so annoying and takes so much time. Because you're trying to avoid blasts as much as possible, right? So you're like pre-spacing everyone out of the two-inch bubbles on, you know, so you're not getting clumped. Is that yeah, why? You're, yeah, you're, you're trying to avoid blast. You're trying to uh, place your models so they can uh, get good positions turn two. Uh, also, uh, your your opponent obviously almost full full engage, uh, and uh, you have to play it safe. You have uh, basically two tools to do that, which is your uh, drone to the hamploy and your recon dash. But uh, almost exclusively, I would say I would not recommend to use recon dash at all, because if you do that, you basically give your opponent opponent too much freedom to move over the table. If you don't take take infiltration or your barricade, 
So basically you have one tool, which is drawn to the hum, which is good, but sometimes not enough. Yeah, because it is like it is like a big traffic jam with that many models. So like you've gotta you've gotta think about like the bugs that can fly so that they don't cause a traffic jam and like even though they can fly you can still like put them in the wrong spot to mess yourself up later and like you can use barge to to overcome the traffic jam thing but you can only use it once and just to use like a whole command point to fix a little blunder like that is really not something you want to do so yeah the the model positioning the model placement and all that is definitely a big hurdle um, but. Yeah, they really do pick up a lot more momentum, like in the mid and later game. Um, is there any kind of like a specific tactic or combo that that you think is especially cool, fun, exciting that people haven't really been chatting about? Well, I can recommend a couple of things. First of all, I really like to use uh, one of my barricades uh, and put it uh, behind the uh, deployment zone front line, if I can call it that. So you put your barricade backwards in the, your deployment and you put your bugs there. Because they uh, have fly and they move kind of fast, they can uh, move around the board from there uh, and uh, this gives you space to place all your other models uh, in the front so they can move uh, more efficiently. And, uh, well, another recommendation, uh, I would say, is uh, don't forget about your Hawk abilities, I would say. The, your okay. models are not really just, uh, just mid-backs who punch stuff. No, they're not. You can all, always, like, uh, charge with your blood spawn and not fight. You can always uh, use your barrage ploy with your uh, lumbar gust to move forward and just deal motor wounds and not uh, and not do anything at all uh, or use your, your flash schemer to fall back from something and just go on the objective to have it under control so this is uh, quite important to, to do uh, and uh, but if we're talking about the fourth one the vulgar is uh, don't track on, on, on the objective it's not worth it it's not worth it at all you can do that later. Yeah. I think just so everyone knows, I think the reason why you're talking about this is because each of the four big boys has their own unique ability. And just using them as charge forward and do damage is not always going to be the most powerful thing. Because looking at something like the Flesh Screamer, because it has the ability to reduce um, control on objectives and make things harder to pick up, you can actually charge on top of two APL models, use your horrifying shrieking so that you can go actually... Um, basically mess with people's uh, mission actions, right? Yes. Yeah. This, this so very, you know, very effective on loot. Mm -hmm. So like the Flesh Screamer's ability is each time an operative would perform a pickup within three inches of this operative or you're within control of an objective marker, you reduce the APL. So being able to use the secondary abilities outside of the melee abilities is very important for Gellerpok's success. I think you mentioned the Lumbergast being able to do the spike charge with barge right so barge lets you move through models and over light terrain and then spike charges perform a free action and then when it finishes for each enemy operative within engagement range you they suffer d3 mortal wounds so if you can line up a spike charge with barge through into like a pile of three models you can do an extra three d3 mortal wounds before you even fire an attack off with the lumber ghast. yes this is a very important uh so for, first of all i would a uh, little bit correct you. Unfortunately, it's only models, not light light terrain. Okay. Uh, I wish it was light terrain as well, but no, it's only mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I... But but this is important in situations when uh, first of all, when you have uh, one AP, would use your stun, and uh, you are basically locked with uh, one model in your engagement range. Uh, so you can always like fight this model and kill it with your lumber gust. But uh, why do that when you can? Once again, barge, deal mortal wounds to like maybe one or two models as well, change your position to more efficient, and also maybe uh, charge the models who already activated, and uh, basically keep your position safe for all, at this turning point. Yeah, because I think one of the big pieces of advice that people get when playing against Gellerpox is being able to reduce their APL. So being able to have ways to use these models when they're stunned is actually very important. And I think you've called out the bloat spawn is one of the best ones because if you charge with the bloat spawn, 
you lock people up and you don't even have to fight them. They can ju- you can just stand there and if they try to run away, they can get they can get stopped because of the tentacled grasp, which is yep. what we saw. I saw that in New Mexico where Orion in the final game against Ace was able to get three hunter clay models because he charged through a door and locked up three models. They tried to fall back, they failed, and then he tried to attack the bloat spawn and bloat spawn fought back and killed everyone. <laughs> Oh, interesting. I didn't, didn't know this detail. That's very cool. Oh, yeah. So blo- the bloat spawn, I think, in the finals at New Mexico last year, I think the one bloat spawn basically did five models worth of work. It tentacled grasp through floor and killed a Sicarian at full health. Then it charged Ooh. three models. One of them fell back, failed. The other two decided to melee the bloat spawn, did, I think, maybe like four or five damage, and then it killed both of them. Oh, and wow. then the last one, he, and then he soaked a shot from the Arquebus. So the bloat spawn did a lot of work. So making sure that you use the alternate abilities is super, super important. So I think it's a good, good reason to restress that for anyone finding the Geller Pox hard. Yeah. Also, I may recommend people to uh, do one more thing, which is uh, don't always auto take tech infection, because this is a pretty easy tech op to use uh, to get the OEP for. But it's not always best. Uh, people used to like spam it, only take tech infection. Uh, but I, I recommend trying other things, uh, like trying out uh, Rampant Nightmare. It's really good uh, against uh, many wound models like uh, Commandos, which are popular nowadays, uh, Felgors, uh, and similar teams. Yeah, I think and the French scene just had their finals this weekend also. And their winner was a Gellerpox player, and he mentioned how Gellerpox is a nightmare for commandos. Can you speak on that, maybe? I would say that it's not really a nightmare, but this is a white even matchup, maybe a little bit more into Gellerpox. Mm -hmm. Uh, The thing is, uh, the problem with this matchup is uh, commandos... uh, have to concentrate uh, on either of two things. When you are playing against Gallipox, you should always uh, decide what you want to do. You either focus the big guys, or you focus the little guys. Uh, you can't play otherwise. You can't, you can't do both. Well, one faction can do both, which is Vedgard. But uh, uh, no other team can do that. Well, it also m- maybe uh, Breachers. Navi Breachers can do that as well. But other teams should choose one thing. And uh, commandos uh, sh- can always uh, can only choose one of these things, but uh, the problem is uh, some of the operatives don't have uh, uh, options to focus the, the small guys. For like, like for example, uh, you obviously can always throw dynamite at the uh, at the small guys. This mm-hmm. is very easy to do. You you can also throw your stick bombs at them. Uh, maybe charge them after you uh, sneak a git. But uh, all the other guys, like your rocket boy, like your shooter boy, they are not so fast and uh, not not always can get to the uh, small guys so fast. And uh, when they get, they can already get demolished by hulks. So you, the Hulks are all quite good against any of the 10 wound models, right? So between the injury aura and just being having 18 wounds, they can almost always murder any of the boys they touch in melee. Well, the, with the exception of Bloodspawn, who has mm. a very uh, Sweeney profile, he mm. can always like hit all six or hit nothing. Mm-hmm. So the combination of injury bubble and then the melee, I think the melee strat ploy, means that you're generally able to manage the melee threat of the boys and then having the out activation against the Geller po- for the in the Geller Pox's favor means that you can generally at least neutralize some of the ex- more explosive plays of the commandos right now is what you're finding yeah true and uh, you know uh, so at this team tournament uh, I've played uh, against commandos uh, in the finals so mm-hmm. uh, so as uh, well, I, I didn't mention it, we, we took the second place, by the way, of my team. Uh, and uh, in the finals, uh, I played versus Commandos, and I won, and I didn't use the injure ploy at all. 
Oh. I very. think at uh, this very moment, when it is can only be used uh, on Hulks, it's not really worth it, unless you are playing against Leeds, like okay. Legionary. Okay, you can so just this, where the nerfs, the nerfs have definitely changed your playstyle over time then? Uh, a little bit, but mm. even before that, I didn't use the, this ploy a lot. Well, I did it, but after some uh, games, I decided that this is a little bit overrated ploy. Okay, interesting. I thought that, or are you using, um, I guess one, one of the last questions I have, at least on playstyle for Gellerpox is, how often are you taking Seek and Destroy and how often are you taking Security at this point? And, oh, or do you have is, matchups where you do one or the other? Oh, this is actually a good, good question for discussion because uh, uh, I heard many people saying Security is bad, or, like the worst tech up, tech up deck overall. For Gellerpox, completely not. This, for Gellerpox, se uh, Security is amazing. Mm -hmm. But it's very map dependent, very map dependent, dependent and the opponent as well. Mm -hmm. So seek and destroy is always easy to play, but security on many maps uh, is also very useful. The thing is, uh, the where I don't like security is uh, when I play the open maps, which uh, where deployment is in the uh, corners. Uh, in these situations, I don't like security because uh, we usually you uh, get you use security you, uh, get get security points with your small guys, but on such maps uh, it is very far uh, to go to this center line or center control, and in many situations it is very unsafe to do that. So this is uh, what I recommend to not do at least. Okay, so you like Seek and Destroy generally because it's easy enough to play, especially probably against the more hordy teams. Well, not not generally. I say like maybe fifty five to forty five Seek and Destroy. Okay, maybe something like that. And you find that security is nice because it lets your small guys force your opponent to commit, and then let your big guys kind of come in and do stuff after. Oh, uh, I would say uh, uh, most teams cannot really even commit to do anything. Because uh, it's really hard to uh, get uh, over the map, over the board, uh, effectively, and uh, at least at least a couple of your little guys will get on the center line, on certain control, or seize ground. It's pretty pretty much inevitable to do. Okay, yeah, I've always thought that security was a very powerful ability f or a very powerful tech up deck for the Geller Pox to be able to have access to you. Because you, it forces your opponent to kind of come towards you, which is not what you want to be doing when you're playing against them, right? You'd rather be chipping them, chipping them from farther away and then engaging on stuff at your discretion. But security says, if I stand here, I will get points. So yeah, come get me. A, that's a very good point, actually. I mm -hmm. agree with that completely. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, if you take something like Rampant Nightmare along with center, center line, central control, it lets you basically say, my small guys are going to stand in the middle of the board. You can either come and get them, or my hulks will roam around at the edges, delete your dorks, and get and score that way. And it basically gives your opponent like a do or die. I think back when the injury bubble emanated off of the mutants and the, the hulks, it was even more gross that security was allowed. Because then you can just say, come and get me, and then just have injury bubbles everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, uh, don't uh, forget there are the in, in security deck, there is uh, one uh, tech op, which is Q, Q, Q more guys, which is pro protect assets, mm -hmm. which is quite yeah. good, actually, in, uh, yes. in the critical ops decks, because you have six objectives, and there is always someone on objective, and killing two guys is not really a big problem, usually. And it's not that hard to score. Yeah, I think the big difference between Seek and Destroy and Security on those uh, that basically protect uh, assets and eliminate guards is that eliminate guards is center line and your opponent's objectives, whereas escort operatives, or not escort operatives, protect assets is any of the six objectives, and you yeah. have to kill two on those objectives. So they're good. They're both good. And the fact that you know Gellerpox can play either end of the spectrum is very very powerful because you basically look at the map look at your opponent and decide which of these two tack up decks is going to provide more value 
Yeah, also, or force your opponent to engage in your lines, which is also a good thing for you. Because if your opponent is engaging your Geller Pox mutants in melee first before your hulks get touched, you're like, that's fine. I don't need them. Yeah. Also, there is, uh, well, at least uh, in the past uh, maybe several months, at least mm-hmm. in my, well, not my, but like uh, all over the world, uh, in, in TTS, both in Russia, uh, people are getting used to playing against Stick and Destroy. And when you review it, next turn, there is pretty much no guys on the points. And uh, you just uh, can only get one or maybe even zero VP. And with protect assets, it's much easier because you leave your opponent no choice. Yeah, especially if you are playing uh, security because you're like, I'm just going to stand around. If you don't come to me, I will get points. So it kind of forces your opponent to engage you on your in your areas, right? Because if you put a model in an objective on conceal behind a barricade, your opponent has to engage it either with shooting or melee, but they're probably going to have to be on the objective for them to interact with you that way. True. So you can go to your opponent into the protect ta- pr- protect assets tech op, which is nice. Yes, this is true. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why Geller Pox has been touched with the nerf bat probably like, what, five times I think at this point? Yeah, but this is such a small nerf, oh, well, ex- with the exception of the first one, which uh, lowers the range of Technokers. Uh, all the other nerfs are like om- almost nothing, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think the six up feel no pain on the mutants and glitchlings matters. And then the techno curse one was definitely one that needed to happen because there was no real way for the shooting teams to really interact with them before. Yes, this is. Yeah, especially on In the Dark. I remember on In the Dark, it was like a glitchling stands in a room and Pathfinders just scoop up, <laughs> scoop to the one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was really annoying. But at the same time, we've got Felgors who are just completely destroyed by GW. Yeah. Never bet. <laughs> Felgors came out and were like, ah, they could play Recon, and then they were like, oh, never mind, they just won't get played. Yeah. And they say, and then while Geller Fox and Void Dancers, I like a little bit, uh, we'll touch them a little bit, and then a little bit more, but nothing serious. This is mm-hmm. why uh, probably Geller Fox are still one of the best teams to play, in my opinion. Yes, their their tool set has not changed. It's just uh, they focused in on what tool set you're allowed to have. I think it's kind of like the Chaos Cult nerfs, where initially they came out and everything was good, and now it's like, well, okay, we want your big guys to be good, so we'll make those good and everything else a little bit worse. And that's basically what they've been doing on Galapox. They're like trimming, like whittling away pieces of the rules until they got to the point of the four the four Hulks have to do most of the damage, and everything else is useful for playing the game. Uh, you know, like I would a little bit disagree with that because. Oh. Uh, Chaos Scout nerfs are much more efficient because uh, there is one thing uh, which uh, hit uh, Chaos Scout a lot. Um, mm-hmm. This is not Funeral Pain. This is not the Icon ability. This is a Ceaseless on Mutants. Okay, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. before that, even if uh, you didn't have torments, your Mutants with Relentless can still uh, wreck things up. They were still very, yeah, they were probably too good, I think. Yeah, still effective. Yeah. But now with Sizzless, they are kind of, um, kind of Sweeney, can miss, can do, do, can do zero damage, can be killed more easily. So this is one of the, one of the bigger things that uh, nerfed Chaos Scout to be. They're still above average, I would say. They're still a good team to play and can still win tournaments. Yeah, but the tournaments are still are... very powerful. But yeah, now, the, now the Dark Commune are much worse than they used to be, so you can't rely on them to do all of the work. Because before, yeah. back when the Injury Bubble came off of like the Blessed Blades, it was just impossible for you to interact with the team on at any point in the game, basically. Yeah. And now they, now they definitely have like a, a power curve, so it's like the first two torments spike the team's power level, and if you manage those and not too much else happens afterwards, like the team drops off really hard... Um, which is which is a part of the Chaos Cult. But Geller Pox are, you know, they have their own play style, which is a lot of dorks and then the four very powerful guys that are always very powerful. <laughs> Compared to the yeah. Chaos Cult, where it's like, maybe if you play well, you might end up with six really powerful models and then a bunch of dorks that are okay. Yeah, yeah true, but now they are not so powerful with the six plus funeral pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're much less reliable now. I think the Chaos Cults got nerfed hard enough where they're not obviously broken whereas on release they were obviously broken <laughs> yeah completely yeah all right all right well that's a lot of good gellerpox stuff i think do you have any uh preferences on your uh bug choices i guess before we before we split 
Oh, uh, I would say that, first of all, uh, the grubs, uh, these large grubs, just forget about them. They don't exist. Mm. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, and uh, choosing between flies and uh, curse might is uh, in almost every game you take uh, three flies and one curse might. But in some games, when you are especially against when when you are against leads, like intercession or legionary, uh, and uh, teams who just ignore the minus one APO, uh, you usually take four uh, curse might. Because you don't need, need that out activation, and so you don't don't need to choose uh, three uh, guys, uh, three bugs of one type and one bug of another type to get one additional activation. You just uh, take three curse might who can deal three damage when they charge, and this is quite enough. Okay, so when you're already out activating your opponents really hard, you're actually relying on the chip damage from the curse mites compared to the activation gaming of the the flying eye stinger swarms. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, cool. That, I think that's good advice. I think yeah, uh, I've heard that sludge, sludge grubs are better on In the Dark, where you know the movement matters a little bit less, is what I've heard. But no, you don't feel I, that way. Yeah, I heard. I I, I had the talk with uh, other good veteran, oh, sorry, Gallery Box players, uh, with Orion Wilfong, with Lazarest uh, from Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, I they tried to explain to me how to use sludge grubs. I've tried to do how they told me to do it to do that, mm -hmm. uh, to place them in the front row in, on the first game turn on Into the Dark, to move them up up, up front. But, uh, and I, I played like maybe 10 games like this, but I didn't still didn't, th didn't, didn't feel uh, they were efficient. Okay, so you didn't find on In the Dark that the ability to have uh, four dice on fours, two, two, AP1, splash one, lethal five, was enough reason to have to like muddle around with the lower movement because then all, you have a lot of very slow models, right? Whereas if you're taking more Ice Stinger Swarms, you're allowed to basically run up, stun people, mess with their activation count. And if they don't deal with them, then you can do it again next turn, which is even better for you. And if they do deal with them, now they're in weird positions so that you can go interact with them, right? Indeed, indeed. Okay, so you, yeah, I, don't know. That's, I think that's a nice breakdown. Because I think Sludge Grubs, the arguments for them on In the Dark is they have a reasonable attack for shooting. So it gives you a little bit more range damage, a little bit uh, of area control. But I think the Ice Stinger Swarms being able to stun people out with five dice on sixes, as long as you hit a six one time, you get a stun counter, which is very powerful against all teams outside of elites. Yeah. And then when you're playing against elites or teams that can ignore APL modifiers, you're leaning on the... The fleas, which actually do appreciable damage when they charge. Yeah. So I think that's a also, nice program. Yeah, also another small dice, when you are playing a mirror match where again mm -hmm. other gallery box, it's quite the opposite. You take uh only one fly mm -hmm. and uh three curse mites. Oh, can you explain because, that? Yeah. This uh people might think that uh stunning hawks can be useful. Uh, but uh, it's uh, really much more useful to use your curse might to charge and kill the opponent uh, opponent's uh, bugs. It's much more efficient. Okay. Yeah, because uh, on the second turn, when Gallyprox start to start to fight each other, it's usually how well not usually always how Hawks go go first. They kill each other, and uh, after there's like uh, three or four Hawks left on the board. It doesn't really matter if they're stunned. It's not very, that important uh, because uh, the rest of house will finish the job re regardless of if they're stunned. Uh, and uh, if you have Curse Might, you will not give the, your opponent ability to stun because you will just kill his uh, eye stinners with uh, just your, with your mites. I see. So... In the mirror match, because you're fighting against more two wound models or things that the two three or uh, two three lethal five profile are good against, you're just relying on those to actually break the parity. Whereas yeah, this, the yeah, ice stinger swarms normally are breaking parity and activation count by being annoying things that give minus one APL. Yeah. So you're kind of inverting that a little bit for the one specific match where you hit two wound models, which is yeah. I think just Geller Pox right now, right? Yeah, and the the other thing is uh, curse might. Uh, if you're lucky, can also kill and uh, glitchlings. Okay, that's, yeah. uh, that's yeah. also an important thing. 
Yeah. And I, I would expect that, you know, being able to follow up and help a mutant out in combat is also a thing that curse mites do very well. Where like two mutants hit each other and no one dies, but everyone has taken a little bit of damage. A curse mite can go in and finish up a mutant without too much issue. Yes. True. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's actually a really good note for Gellerpox players. I know some players locally have been struggling with Gellerpox, so I'm excited to be able to hand out uh, some, some more information. Yeah. Um, cool. I think that's uh, we covered a lot this podcast episode. We covered Vetguard being overpowered in Russia. We covered a, some Gellerpox and talked a lot about the Russian scene and how there's you know two vibrant scenes in Moscow and St. Petersburg and a you know a big TTS scene across the whole world. And you're helping to do some of the European stuff. Was there anything else you wanted to call out before we head out for the day? Um, hmm. well, uh, I you would like to. Anything. No, I would like to. I think uh, maybe shout out a few, a few of our guys, if you don't mind. Uh, I would yeah, like no, to no. shout out uh, our uh, player who basically teaches all our uh, newbie players, which is Vova Belenov. Uh, shout out to him. Shout out to our TOs Archie and uh, Kesha, who organize tournaments. Thanks to them. Uh, and uh, shout out to other Russian TOs. And also to my teammates in Turn 2 Initiative. This okay. is uh, my shout outs. And uh, to talk about the tournaments of the upcoming ones, uh, we have uh, two very interesting, co coincidentally uh, similar tournaments next month. Uh, they are not your usual tournaments. Uh, first off, we have in Moscow a tournament called F Dameta which uh, is on 5th of November, and it will only use Compendium teams. So with, uh, with new maps, new missions, but only Compendium. And then in St. Petersburg on 26th of November, which is uh, uh, the first time this tournament is announced, we will have tournaments uh, called Retro, Retro Flashback, which will be kind of similar, but we will only use the old missions. So we are playing new new teams, but with old missions. I've actually run a tournament like that somewhat recently because uh, a lot of the newer players have never seen the old missions. So I just brought back the uh, brought back the old layouts. I didn't bring back the old mission missions, but I did bring back the old uh, objective layouts. And how was it? They seem like they had fun. I think for all the players who've been playing in the last year with just the crit ops, I think they were like, oh, this is weird. And then for all the older players, it was like, oh, we haven't seen these in a long time. So it was a nice mix up. Yeah. Imagine playing, imagine telling a new player that you can carry an objective. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole bunch of things that have just been like taken out of the rules for most players. So yeah. it's, it's fun. Yeah. I, I would say it's a good time. Yeah, and also uh, obviously I can uh, recommend people to uh, if you if you want to try out TTS, there is uh, currently a registration for our Command Point tournament series. Uh, you can join the Command Point Discord server and uh, get a registra registration there. Uh, we are having TTS tournament which uh, goes uh, it's it's one game per week. Uh, in four, uh, so there will be uh, five rounds and then a finals. It's uh, kind of easy to play. You only need to play one game per week. Uh, so no pressure. You can always find time. Uh, and uh, just uh, try your luck in TTS with uh, players from all over the world. Yeah, I think a good thing about TTS right now is you can literally play any of the teams with very little actual like effort, right? So we'll drop a link to the Steam Workshop link, I think, because I think you probably have it, right, Kirill? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can get that. Yeah, we'll we'll drop that in for anyone who's curious and wants to try out, you know, TTS. Now's a good time to jump in. Of course. Yeah, I highly recommend it. TTS is sweet. Yeah, and before we head out, you know, uh, shout out to our Discord, our Patreon, and our sponsor, Lester's Workshop. You know, without without everyone everyone's support, we wouldn't be continuing to doing these kinds of things. So it's it's been great. Thanks, Kirill, for coming on and uh, chatting up Russia. Thanks to you guys for inviting me. Yep. Thank you listeners for making it until the end. See you next week. Bye.